Okay, look at that beautiful sunset. I had uh, earlier today, I have this tree right beside my house and I had a flock of five parrots in there, green macaws. They're called the great, great green macaws. Really great, uh, really great sound they make. And there was five of them there for about 20 minutes. Got some nice video of that. Very happy about that. Who do we have? Sydney, Toronto, Philadelphia. Three from Sydney. Wow. Kitchener, Waterloo. India. There we go. Okay, let's uh, get to some questions here. Uh, what do we got? Any advice you can give on feeling rushed in the learning process for CFA when studying a topic? Also, how do you deal with the frustration that comes with studying? Frustration is good. Frustration is, is it means that you are forming new neurons. So let's talk about that feeling. How, what, what, what is it our brain doing that makes us feel, you know, when you feel frustrated, that feeling you get? It's because your pathways, your neural pathways, uh, don't recognize what you're doing. So there's, there's no... Uh, path that the electrons can travel and electrons usually travel on paths of least resistance so what it tries to do is it tries to make new connections and that feeling of frustration is your uh, your uh, neurons attempting to make new connections in your brain it's the same feeling your muscles get when you are uh, lifting in the gym and you feel that burn in your legs when you're doing squats you feel that burn in your arm when you're doing curls that burn you get that's the same, eh, not the same, but think about it the same way, is that you are uh, forcing your brain to make new connections, which means you're getting smarter. So frustration is good. If you don't push yourself to frustration, you don't exceed your last level. So frustration is a good thing. Don't, don't fear frustration. Um, as far as feeling rushed in the learning process, that is a big problem. You cannot learn in a hurry. And if you're feeling rushed and you start rushing through everything, every minute is, wa is a wasted minute. It's just a wasted minute. It is better to know half of that reading really well than to attempt to know it all a little bit. Because if I ask you difficult questions, you're not going to get any of them because none of your knowledge is over a certain threshold. So slow down. Don't worry about it. Just slow down. Travel at the speed limit of your brain. Um, it's more rewarding. Uh, you feel victories a lot more often because you say, oh, I get this, I get that. And after you uh, build a nice foundation, even though you feel like you're going slow, once you have that solid foundation in, later readings build upon that uh, and other sections build upon certain knowledge as well that you start to go faster later on. Um, for example, I'm learning Spanish right now, and I was uh, using Duolingo and using, learning a lot of words. But I didn't have the structure of the language. I didn't have the grammar. So what I have to do is go really slow and get the grammar down. Well, I'm not learning a lot of words at this point in time, but I am learning the rules of grammar a lot better now. So that when I get back to the words, the words will fit on that infrastructure super fast. So the path to get to perfection uh, is not just a straight 45 degree line if you plot perfection on the vertical and time on the horizontal it's not a 45 degree line it's a line that is very close to the horizontal for uh, you know what seems like a long period of time and then it grows exponentially uh, you just have to have faith that that's how the learning process works is you spend a lot of time Hardly going anywhere, but building a solid foundation. And after that, learning is, is exponential. It, the, the later topics uh, pile on nicely. So um, I would say to everybody out there, the best way to not feel rushed is to not fall into the, the trap of thinking that you have a lot of time because the exam is in August and it's only beginning of April. Don't fall into that trap. Uh, use the amount of time you have. Right now you have time for August, you got good time for November. So if you're writing for August and November, to feel, to not feel rushed, you do it now. 
is you, you work at it every day so that if you are frustrated, you go, I got lots of time. You won't feel, uh, you won't feel rushed. Um, all right. What video to watch for level three on how to answer different types of essay questions? Discuss, describe. Um, I do that closer to the exam. So there are five mock exams and then two, I think two seminars, maybe three, maybe, I think maybe two seminars. So as you get closer to the exam, I do live walkthroughs of those. And it's not just, you know, here's the answer. It's, okay, what keyword do we have? What are we looking for in the answer? What's the structure of the answer if we have identify, if we have uh, determine and justify versus determine and support? Justify is slightly different than support, which is uh, probably slightly different than explain. So um, the important part of all the answers is they're short. They really are short. 20 words maximum. Maximum, maybe 25 if you don't have the English language. Usually the structure is two bullet points. The first bullet point being you said this and there's something in the vignette that you can point to. You said this, therefore it means that. That's usually a good support. So determine what course of action to take, buy or sell. You click on sell and your answer would be, well, you said this, right? It's written down right here. You said this, hence it means this. Uh, that's usually the structure of an answer. It is just that short and to the point. But as you get closer to the exam, there will be a whole bunch of live sessions you can attend uh, where we walk through every question and throughout the five exams and the two seminars, I think we cover every keyword you're going to come across. What do we got? Vancouver, Houston. Isn't that uh, too bright to look at? Actually, I can look right at it right now as the sun starts setting. I find I can stare at the sun a lot longer, but I don't because I'm not stupid. Just because my eyes aren't hurting when I look at it doesn't mean it's not causing damage, but uh, I can look right at it. It's no big deal. But anyways, there you go. Look at that beautiful big ball in the sky there. Nice sunset. I think it'll be a nice one tonight. Um, do you think there's any advantages to a CPA, CFA combo? Or is it overkill in most cases? I think there's an advantage if you have a CPA and adding a CFA, but I don't see an advantage if you uh, are a CFA trying to add a CPA. Um, no, I, I, I mean, if you want to be in the finance industry, you don't need a CPA. The CPA is going to go into things that are just not going to be valuable to you uh, at all. Um, no. They might be incrementally useful every now and then, um, but I don't know that they'll be valuable uh, overall. Galway, Ireland. I was from Nairobi when I was doing level three. Failed and almost gave up actually anyways. You made me pass level one when I was doing a 218. Great. Um, What's your take on CFA increasing price and also charging Canada's additional cost for the official PDF books? Well, you know, I don't know that I have a thought on that. Um, they are an organization like any organization that, that, you know, there is a concern for revenue, even though they're not a non, they're, they're a non-profit doesn't mean that they're not for profit. Right, nonprofit just means they have no share capital. They don't distribute it. There are no investors that, or shareholders they distribute the money to. That's what nonprofit is, but that doesn't mean a nonprofit isn't concerned about profit. They can still be profit driven, just nobody gets it. Um, although I don't know where they would be going with their balance sheet. I think last time I, I looked, they had like 500 million in assets in investments. So, What's it all for, right? Um, but, I mean, who hasn't increased prices, right? Who, who hasn't? And uh, as far as them charging for the PDF, you do have the, the written content in the learning ecosystem. It's just on the screen. It's not printed out for you, but everything in the PDFs you have on the screens, um, the PDFs are just in digital format. You don't actually get a hard copy. You just get digital format. 
but they're not just the, when you pay i think it's three hundred dollars you're getting uh, uh the um, six extra mock exams in that along with the digital pdfs i mean you have some companies that charge a hundred dollars for one exam which i think is is just a bloody crime but you have some companies charging a hundred bucks for one exam uh they're charging 300 for six you're getting six more mock exams and the pdfs uh, i think if they were a for-profit with share capital uh they'd probably be finding ways to extract the, well i don't know they're pretty good at extracting money i don't know if they'd find more ways i don't know if they would if they had shareholders would they be would their prices be higher i don't know i really don't know I already think that for some of the things, some of these other little specialty programs they have, you know, certificate in this, certificate in that, I think that for what they for what you get, I think they, they overcharge, but I think everybody overcharges, so I'm <laughs> not much to go on on that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I seem to think that if you've got half a billion dollars on your balance sheet, you've got that box checked, and if there are no... No, share, no shareholders and no one to distribute capital to. It's not like you have an activist investor telling you to lean into things. I think at this point, they could probably afford to, you know, freeze their prices for the next maybe decade, uh, you know, I think. I don't know. Maybe that's why I'll never be the CEO of CFA Society. Um, it could be the salaries. I know there, there are some pretty big salaries in there. What else have we got here? What's your take on the OMB? Did that, any tips to say focused on study? Um, I don't know if I have tips so much as, you know, uh, sort of a broader, a broader focus, um, you know, I'm reminded of, uh, I think it was, uh, I forget which Bruce Lee uh, movie it was. Uh, but at the beginning, he's meeting with a young student. Uh, and he's giving the student a sort of a lesson on, on how to focus and how to do things. Uh, and he tells him about this, this, the story of the finger pointing at the moon. All right. And he says, don't don't focus too much on the finger because you'll lose sight of the moon's heavenly glow. Uh, meaning don't focus too much on that one thing that you're doing right now. Think about where you're going and, 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 and the whole. See past what you're doing. So keep reminding yourself why you're doing this. Uh, remind yourself that very few people do this uh, and that of the ones that do it, uh, less than 50% pass that this is putting you in an elite group uh, that have the CFA letters. Um, so just, you know, to stay focused, just keep reminding yourself why you're doing it. And don't forget to take a break, right? It's okay to walk away from it if, you, if you're losing focus. It's okay to walk away for 10 or 15 minutes and then come back and just say to yourself, okay, just, just five more, five more pages, that's it. You'd be surprised at how many more pages you do than five when you, when, you know, like to start, if you want to start something, say, all I'm going to do is one learning objective, just, just one. That's, that's my goal here. One learning objective. When I sit down, do one, you know, take off for 10 minutes, come back and say, okay, one more, just one more. And you'll be surprised little by little when you break it down into small little goals like that, uh, how, how much you get through it. Hmm. Asked the CFA a couple years back. I discovered this channel. Love the practical applications of the information. Uh, when will the financial modeling course be available? Um, I'm going to start that in September. Uh, I'm going to probably, I'm going to use three things. Uh, there is a reading at level two at the end of, uh, I think it's right at the end of financial statement. FSA level two, and it's a long reading. It's about 100 pages long for financial modeling, uh, which goes line by line, how you would forecast revenue, you know, whether you're using time series, regression of certain economic variables, things like that. 
We're going to use a lot of that stuff. Uh, we need a spreadsheet model. I think uh, Demodoran has a very good one, and he makes it available for free. I've looked at it. I thought it's comprehensive. It's good, but let's build it, right? So we're, gonna, we're going to build his model. We're going to start with a blank sheet, and we're going to end up with what he has. So we'll just build it, uh, and then we'll use Tesla. Uh, because he had already done one for Tesla, and we'll use Tesla, and we'll see where we differ. But we'll start that in September. Uh, Baton Rouge. Look at that. Studying for level two. Uh, fourth attempt. Fear I have a low IQ. Well, trying different study strategies, but any advice, inspiration for going again? Well, if it's your if it's your fourth attempt, um, some there's, there's something wrong. Uh, you passed level one, so let's we can we can shelve the ability thing. You have the ability. You pass level one. Uh, you might be trying to study level two like you studied level one. Level two is um, evaluation level. Lots of numbers, lots of formulas. You can't, you can't read math. You actually have to get your hands dirty. You actually have to do it. You have to do it again and again and again and again. That's the only way to do numbers is again and again and again. Maybe you're approaching level two the same way you approach level one. Very difficult. You can probably memorize your way through level one. Very difficult to do that at level two. You, you, you have to have uh, some kind of um, execution knowledge on, on how, to, uh, how to value things, not just you know, memorize a bunch of formulas, but you actually have to work with them. Hmm. How hard is level two compared to level one? It's more difficult. Um, well, let me, let me back that up. Are you quantitatively oriented? So for me, numbers were easy in university. I took, I loaded up on numbers courses because they were easy A's, I mean easy A's. So is level two hard? I would say level one is harder than level two for me because level two's got a lot of numbers. That's easy stuff super easy for me whereas level one's got a lot more readings that are just narrative right so i don't really have any learning advantage over anybody else when it comes to narrative stuff i gotta make notes and i gotta review the notes and try in my head to intuitively see the arguments if not memorize so for me level two would be easier than level one because of the increase in the amount of the quantitative content if you're not quantitatively oriented then yeah it is going to be a harder level than level one uh, which means you just got to give yourself more time if you have the cfa is there an advantage to the cipm um hmm, i don't know uh, you do get a lot of portfolio management in CFA at level three. Uh, probably not as much as, uh, and probably not into detail about some of the, uh, the optimizations that you could make. Uh, the CFA is a generalist designation. Uh, all of the others like uh, CFP, CIPM, FRM, CAIA are specialist designations. So while CFA will touch on each of those domains, uh, they don't go into detail that each of those domain designations have. So, you know, depending on, on what you're trying to get done and where you're going, it could be incrementally beneficial, sure. Any tips and tricks for level two problem solving? So, you know, that comes up a lot, tips and tricks. Uh, um, they're, they're, you know, learning today has pretty much been the same as it has for 5,000 years. Um, it's about putting in the time. If, if there was a faster way, if there were tips and tricks, they would have found their way into the education system long ago. 
So the tools you left university with in terms of how to learn, that's, that's the best we got. That is the best the profession has, right? Any, if there was something better, it would have found its way into the education system. So anybody who says, I've got tips and tricks, I've got a certain method. No, no, they don't have a method, okay? The, the, there is one method, it's called putting in the time. And that is the only method uh, that there is. Now, good instruction will always make your time uh, um, more productive versus bad instruction versus no instruction, especially if you're trying to make sense of a reading where the author's not being very clear, or the author's not writing for a learning audience, you're reading it saying, I don't get it. Well, unless you have a guide, you're probably not gonna get it. Well, not without a lot of searching on the internet uh, and Googling and looking in other textbooks to try to figure out what the hell this author's talking about. So I think the only, the only other thing th uh, than putting in the time is layering on a very good teacher. And if you have those two things, if you're putting in the time and you have a good teacher, that's it. There is no magic. Uh, there's, 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 no, there's nothing that you know, we're holding back and in the last week we present you with these little magic beans that, oh, this is nice. There, there is nothing like that. There is nothing like that. There's good instruction and then there's not good instruction. Uh, and good instruction will just make your time more productive, but make no mistake, you must still put in time, all right? Uh, French Canadian, good. Passion, pragmatic, approach, being contagious, help me grow and mature. Good, good, good. Nice to hear that stuff. Do you know if there's going to be CFI practice pack for level two? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I imagine they're seeing how well the level one uh, is taken up, uh, and if it's taken up well, uh, I'm sure there'll be there'll be level two. The uh, big problem in all of this, especially um, for exam questions, like if you're including mock exams, uh, as you go to level two, and especially to level three, find the writers. Uh, it's not easy. Level one, you could probably find some some decent writers for level one questions. Level two. Uh, it gets a little bit harder uh, only because there is so many possibilities of a question having leaks. By leaks, I mean you write something and then you ask a question about it and you think your question is tight, but you don't realize that there could be multiple answers to your question because you didn't, you didn't really dive deep enough into, into the content to cover all the scenarios. By the time you get to level three, it's even worse. There are very few good writers at level three. So to get a question pack for level two, you would first have to find the writers um, and enough writers to be able to create enough exams uh, that, that it's worth paying for. I don't know if that exists. I don't know that that can be done easily. I'm reproducing your Palantir valuation. Notice you use basic share count, not diluted. Um, I don't think I use basic share count. I, I valued them on uh, price times sales and uh, earnings, and I used the diluted earnings. I think I used diluted earnings, and I, I pointed out the difference between the basic and the diluted end. The significant amount that was added back in CFO for share-based compensation. Um, so, no, I, I, I don't think I, I think I would have used the diluted. Can possibly FMVA be any benefit if I want to be a CFA? Um, FMVA is that that's valuation, right? Um, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. No. My 22-year-old graduate, am I late to start CFA? No, you are not. That's still very young, Lauren, 22. That's still very young. Uh, doing level two in Maine, plan to schedule FRM level one. Question is, considering the overlap in topics, should schedule FRM level one August or November? 
Um, look, coming off of uh, level two, you're just going to have to jump right into level one. And even though there's an overlap, it's not one, it's, you know, the, they say it's 75%. It's, uh, there are still things that are slightly different here and there. So it's not as if, oh, I've got these three sections done. I only have to do one section. It's, yeah, I've done quant and they have quant, but they have a few other little things in quant that aren't in level one or level two. So it's like, okay, well, there's a little bit there, right? So you got to go through all that. Um, I think that after finishing level two in May and then having to jump right into FRM level one for August, you risk burning yourself out. I'd take November and then take a month off. Just take some time off, recharge. You, you burnout is, is rough because when you're burnt out every day, you know, you're 20 minutes in and you're just sick of it. You're just so burnt out. You, you like, you're just sick of it. You don't want to do it anymore. Uh, I can tell you that. Hmm. What are your thoughts about the updated CFA level three curriculum to be tested in February, 2025, not 2024? Well, I can't give you details uh, about what's included. I can give you my opinion. Um, I think you should stick with the common level three program and ignore uh, the the two extra pathways, the private markets and private wealth, uh, I would ignore them completely. Um, and I would stick with portfolio, the portfolio management, which is the traditional level three. Uh, I've looked at private wealth and it's boring. Dear God, is it boring? It's long, um, 500 pages and it's boring. Uh, it's, it's neither about analysis nor asset management. <laughs> and it is boring that if you want to be an independent advisor or a wealth manager, there's the CFP. There's a designation for that. I think it is a massive waste of time. Uh, and it is boring. Dear God, I thought that I had the benchmark for boring, which was AT&T's conference calls. If you want to be bored to tears, if you want a benchmark for boring, tune into one of AT&T's conference calls. And after an hour, I want you to answer one question. Name one thing they said. Repeat one thing they said. You, you can't because it's so boring, you, you just tuned out. Your mind just traveled. Well, I was wrong. AT&T conference calls are a Disneyland ride compared to private <laughs> private wealth is so bloody boring so if you want to be bored to tears in a long section go ahead and take that one for private markets um pretty pathetic treatment uh i would say that for what is covered and how it's covered waste of your time waste of your time it was a waste of my time waste of your time uh, I would stick with the level three, the traditional level three approach, the portfolio management approach, and just ignore the other two. They're not ready. It's their first year on each one. And I can tell they're not ready. They're not ready at all. It's, it's not a good treatment at all, at all. You'll be more disappointed than anything else. So uh, private markets isn't where it needs to be. Um, and as is common with CFAI over the last three, four years, the quality of the content has gone downhill. Uh, this year is no different. I don't know if that answers your question. I can't talk about any particular thing, but I can you know, give you an overall opinion of it. Um, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. You're not, you're not missing, trust me, you're not missing anything at all. You're not missing anything. And taking the private markets, I think, risks beating all the excitement out of you about private markets. You ever have a, an undergrad course that you think, 
sounds really interesting, but then you get a bad textbook and a bad professor and you just can't wait for that course to end and then you never want to see that topic ever again in your life. Meanwhile, had you had a better professor with a better textbook, you might have followed that. You might have said, this is what I want to do. So the wrong thing uh, can leave the wrong taste in your mouth about something and this risks doing that. So I would, my strongest recommendation to everybody is ignore them. Just, just ignore them. Um, ignore them. <laughs> ignore them. Uh, I, I don't know what else to say on that. Um, past level two in 2022, got too busy with my new job and two newborns during the last two years. A lot of twos in there. Right, level two in 2022, you got too busy with a new job, two newborns in the last two years. <laughs> a lot of twos in there. So I'm trying to get back to level three. Ah, there we go, level three. Any preparation advice? I'm thinking about August 2025. 2025? Next year. Uh, well, if it's 2025, you, you, you've got a long, a long wait i mean you you don't really have to do much till what december january i mean starting too soon is you know i think i think it's just as bad to start too soon as it is too late six to seven months i think is yeah that's about that's about right six to seven months but you know 12 months eh, it's a little much you, you i don't know that you would use those 12 months productively. But I mean, you got one level left. You got one level left. So why not? Why not? I started CFA at 26. Never failed on any of the papers, even the computer-based test in L3. Good to hear. September, please bring it sooner. I can't bring it sooner because this is the time of year I I do, I work on CFA content. Uh, so, you know, it's a trade-off, right? Tried level one twice, never made it. Always start off very strong, but work, family, and other obligations always get in the way. Any tips here? Well, you got to make a sacrifice, right? Um, you know, if it's not a priority, then it's not a priority. Don't do it. You don't have to do it. Like there's this there's this belief that you know other I see other people with it I should have it too you don't you don't need it unless your employer says you're unpromotable without it you don't need it nothing beats experience there are literally thousands of successful people in finance tens of thousands of successful people that don't have a charter. Uh, and of all the people who have a charter, there are thousands who are unsuccessful, okay? So it is, it is no guarantee of success. It's an interaction effect. If you were going to be successful, uh, this probably may open doors sooner and get you there faster. But you're going to be successful anyways. So, I, I, you know, if it's, if it's just not a priority for you, don't do it. Uh, it sounds like it's not a priority because other things have gotten in the way and they sound like priorities, work, family. I don't know what other obligations are, but, you know, if you sum up your your day, you know, and you see there's three or four things in there, you know, you're spending eight hours a week on Netflix, uh, you know, 10 hours a week in the gym. Well, if this is something you want, you're going to have to sacrifice something. That's, that's how sacrifice works. You can have anything you want. What sacrifice are you willing to make? Uh, if it's not a priority, then if you don't want to sacrifice anything, then put it on a shelf. Who cares? It's not, it's not a big deal. Is it possible to clear level one for a full-time student in five months? I don't know. I get that question a lot. Can I do it in five months? I don't know because the the variable in there is you, right? You're the variable. I don't know anything about your willingness to put in the time. I don't know anything about your aptitude or your ability. 
Uh, I don't know uh, how quickly you learn. Uh, I know nothing about you. So to say five months is enough time, it's enough time for me. I mean, a month is enough time for me, but you're not me. Uh, so unless I have you as a student in a class, that by the midterm, I pretty much know what you'd be capable of. I mean, you've, you've demonstrated, you know, maybe a case study, a presentation, a midterm. I, I pretty much know what your aptitude is. Then I could answer that question, but I know nothing about you. So I can't answer that question. I'm from a non-finance background, working in the manufacturing sector. Always had an interest in finance, been reading about it rigorously. I'm sure level one would be immensely, would help immensely, but not sure about level two and three. Well, I mean, you know, level one is, is uh, a lot of declarative knowledge. You know, like fixed income is, well, what are the types of bonds that you have? What are the features of bonds? What's a spot rate? What's a forward rate? What's a par rate? You know, what's an asset-backed security? What are credit spreads? How do we measure it? Like, it's a lot of know what and just declarative knowledge. Level two is a valuation level where you start looking at an equity and you say, well, how much is it worth based on the fundamentals? So it's a lot of modeling in terms of, you know, the different types of valuation metrics, discounted cash flow. Well, you're going to require some forecast in the spreadsheet. There's comparables, uh, residual income approach. So it's about valuing the assets. I think that's helpful. Uh, I do think it's helpful to think, about, to think about that because while you may not actually engage uh, in a discounted cash flow model, you do, you will understand the effect that the numerator has because it's a discount rate, right? You will understand the effect that the, the company's cost of capital has on its present value, that when you see a company uh, who is uh, increasing their leverage or buying back shares, uh, uh, let's say a company with a 60% uh, um, you know, debt, 40% equity, and they're buying back shares, you know leverage is increasing. And if leverage is increasing, at some point that's going to increase weighted average cost of capital. That may not actually boost share price. It helps you think through problems like that because you understand the valuation process without actually having to value something. So you'd be surprised. Uh, level two may be useful. I think if you don't want the charter, I think the ethics section is a colossal waste of your time. Um, you really, that's really a CFA thing uh, and you need to pass it at all three levels. But if you're not if you're not doing this for the charter, just for the level one and level two knowledge, uh, then yeah, that is a colossal waste of your time. Um, so what you can do is you can go to markmeldrum.com, register for free, and the whole level one from 2018 is there. And just start going through it, right? I mean, you don't need the latest level one. You're not going to write the test. You just want you know, the level one experience. Well, there it is. It's on, uh, on, on markmelner.com for free, the 2018. And then, you know, you can judge from there. But if you're not going to write the test, I would say the ethics section is going to be absolutely meaningless for you and a waste of your time. Got four years of experience so far in investment research. Should clear L3 next week. I want to move into asset management. What other certification would complement the charter well? Uh, I don't know that anything would, would be as important as actual experience in asset management because somebody's got to give you money to manage, uh, which is experience and track record. They're not going to look at the initials behind your name. Now, the initials behind your name will give them confidence when they look at your history and your experience, they'll, they'll at least have confidence that you're trained to a certain level, but you're still gonna have to show up with results. The CFA is, are the three big letters. Those are good letters. Um, I don't know that I would keep adding designations. If you wanna be in asset management, I think what you need to do for the next little while is figure out what your pathway there is, not, not, which, you know, not which designation you want. So um, 
for example, uh, uh, let me give you an example based on a game that I used to play. And I used to play against another person. Uh, it was called uh, um, Heroes of Might and Magic, where you you have castles, you build castles, you go out, you you plunder, you raid, you steal, you take over mines, things like that, right? You build your armies and you hope to rule the world. Um, one opponent I played against um, always spent a lot of time building their castle, building their forces, building their army, didn't want to go into battle unless they had overwhelming forces and always lost. Because they spent so much time preparing and they had no experience. They spent so much time preparing, right? Um, that's a good, a good analogy, I think, is there's only so much you can prepare before you got to leave the castle and go fight. Right? That matters more, is the experience, because you get to then judge the size of the opponent's army, and you might find out that they're, that they're not that powerful, that you don't need to build a big army to beat them, right? That, that you can take away a key gold mine and you can starve them of resources very quickly, um, and then just keep one guard at the gold mine and funnel resources to the guard, and all your other players don't need big armies because, you know, that's the thing you have to... So unless you get out there and see the real world, you're not going to really know. So I would say get out of your castle, stop building your, stop building your fortress, stop building your troops, and just get out there, right? And, and figure out how to get into asset management. And then later on, if you come against a roadblock saying, well, you're going to need something else, well, then do it later, right? Do it as you need it, sort of just-in-time learning. Um, would you recommend to college kids who want to work in portfolio management in the future? What would I, what would I recommend? Uh, well, I'd recommend to focus on finance, obviously. If you want to work in portfolio management, uh, make sure you load up on the finance courses. Be well-versed uh, in, in um, uh, equity, fixed income, and derivatives. You better understand derivatives because that is your big risk management tool. It's your fastest risk management tool, uh, and it's your fastest, uh, probably your, your most valuable and fastest leverage tool as well. You better understand derivatives. Um, and, then, and then I would certainly be looking at the CFA and then, you know, sort of uh, leaning towards a job that Maybe you're an analyst for a while, but that there is a track to portfolio management. I mean, what's the point of being a portfolio manager on day one where you scratch your head and say, well, what do I buy? How do I know what to buy, right? At least the analysis uh, will teach you how to look at stocks. And how did you become so articulate? Well, I've had 57 years of practice. <laughs> Two graduate degrees, three undergraduate degrees, and a lifetime in the academic system, and a lot of reading. So uh, there are times where I feel that, you know, I've, my, I've got my, what I say is I have my eloquence, is I can speak and the words just come to me. And the other times I trip over my own words. Sometimes I'll try to explain something and it's just not coming out. And it's like, yeah, I normally don't sound this stupid. Uh, but there are times where, you know, uh, times of the day where I'll, or I'm trying to explain something and it's just not happening. And then other times of the day, words just flow. They just, the ideas come to my head as I'm, as I'm thinking. So I'm not always this way. There's a reason I do these at 5.15 and 6 o'clock is because I've had the whole day to think about stuff. If C of A relevant for people in corporate uh, FP and A. Um, well, um, uh, do you, um, well, let me think about that. Uh, I think if you look at most CFOs, uh, a significant amount of them have a CFA. So, Probably. When you say 32 days to review CFA level three, 35. How many hours per day is this? 
Uh, I don't know that it's any more hours than you put in, two to three hours a day, I think. Uh, and as you get closer to the exam, you lean in, right? You, you, you bring it up to four hours a day and five hours a day, the closer you get to the exam, because you do not want this to be your second last exam. And you can keep reminding yourself of that every day. Do I want this to be my second last exam? And if the answer is no, you lean in, right? So it's, it's, it's like a race. You know, when you're, when you're doing a, like 400 meter or 800 meter, you hit a pace. But then those last 50 meters, you dig deep and you give it all you got. You lean in because you know the finish line is right ahead. You can't maintain that pace for 800 meters, but those last 50 to 75, that's where you, you dig deep and you give it all you got right at the very end. And that's what those last 35 days are, is you've maintained a pace of learning throughout, and then you start the review. Because the finish line is right there, I can see it. Now's the time to dig deep, because I don't want to run this race again. I want to hit the finish line and be done. Um, so... 35 days, I think, is enough time. You start maybe the first week is two hours a day, second week is three hours, then four, then five, and yeah, you're going to have to sacrifice some things, but, you know, dig deep, lean in. Those last couple of weeks, it's all you have is all that because you don't want to do this again. If you, wanna, if you want to use more time, then this could be your second last exam. You don't have to lean in, but you'll just collectively use more time right so that's the time to sacrifice uh does cfa help in getting good business schools globally well you must be in a school you must be at least i think in your third year to write level one so you're already in a school if you're saying does it help with good graduate schools uh, incrementally it would, uh, but your transcripts are going to matter more. You know, where you, where you did your undergrad and what your transcripts look like are going to matter more uh, for the school, for the grad school that you want to go to if you're thinking about MBA. Independent, 30-year-old, <clears throat> business does $2 million a year, makes 10 to 15 net. I have a dream to become a CFA holder, but no time to study uh, uh, full time. Should I just try to focus on business? Yes. Yes. Uh, if you're 10 to 15 percent, you're 200 to 300 a year. Yes. Analysts aren't making that. And I, uh, I guess the question would be, what is it that you think CFA would help you do better? Um, if you're already at two, you already know how to get to two. You should know how to get to three. Uh, and if you're at 10 or 15 percent uh, and you're efficient, maybe those are your margins. But if you're not efficient, maybe hiring an administrator might it cost you money. But if you can squeeze five, six percent efficiency uh, out of that and net another 10 or 15 grand on top of the two to three hundred, you know, I think you know the path that you want to go. I don't know what it is that you're doing. So I can't really say whether CFA content will help you or not. Uh, but I know what it's like to run a business and to be learning something new at the same time. When, um, when, when one gets busy, if business, if business needs something, the learning goes to the side, always. It, 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 it cannot be a priority. You cannot give up. Uh, an evening of doing something for the business that needs to be done to learn something new. I mean, you have to grow hay while the sun shines, right? And if if your business is doing well, that's what you got to focus on right now. Uh, there is no small way to do level one. It's 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 not as if you can do a section, pass an exam, and then take a little while, do a section, pass. You got to do all 10 sections. You got to pass one exam and it does require a sacrifice, five, six months of your time. Uh, and you have to ask yourself at, at the end of the day, is it going to make you better at what you're doing? You know, if, if, if the answer is yes, then, then you're going to have to sacrifice something to get done. If the answer is, well, I don't know, or I don't think so, then, eh, you know, have another dream. Um, how about CPA? Is it worth it? Well, that's accounting, right? Um, is it worth it? You know, is it worth it for what? 
Uh, you do need it to be a practicing accountant. Uh, given your opinion of the new CFA pathways, what do you think about the future of the charter? Will it lose perceived value? You know, if you asked me that four years ago, I would have said no. Um, now, uh, I would say unless they change the path they're on, uh, yeah, uh, because I think anybody that's going through private wealth management or private markets is going to see very quickly, uh, um, you know, that it, it wasn't worth the time. <laughs> Sorry, CFA, but it's not worth the time. It's just not ready yet. Uh, private markets is just not deep enough and everything you read at level one and level two, well, here it is again, along with a whole bunch of other tangents that are so outside the learning objective as to be a complete waste of everybody's time. You're reading it and going, what does this have to do with the learning objective? What does this, what do these 10 pages have to do with anything? Like, where is the author going? It's a waste of time. So unless they get back to the academic writers um, and, and a company that can edit, they used to use Wiley writers, but they decided to use their own writers or develop their own writers, and they lost that editing bench. Yeah, yeah, I think it's just a matter of time before the complaints about, you know, the content start to matter and people are saying, oh, my God, like, like this was pathetic. And so it's certainly not helping the reputation. I will say that, that this, these two tracks are not making the reputation or helping the reputation. Maybe they won't hurt, but they're certainly not helping. Uh, in my eyes, it hurts their reputation, but maybe, you know, maybe I've been at it too long. Let's see, will you be doing past party stream this Thursday and next? Uh, no, I'll be doing it next Tuesday. Uh, same as I do, uh, same as this one. Look at that beautiful sky. Uh, it's much more red and orange here. I'm looking down at the screen, and, and in real life, it's much more red and orange. But isn't that beautiful? Every night, well, not every night, but mostly every night, that's what I get. That's what I get. Well, so we got another 10 minutes here. I used my emergency savings to pay for level one. Take it, May. Very excited. I know it'll be worth it. Okay. What are your thoughts on supplementing the content with some undergrad textbooks to hammer home the concepts? Um... So, yeah, the whole book and, and Fabozzi will go into more detail. Uh, but more detail than you'll be tested on. So it's nice to explore. It's nice to say, I don't want to know a little bit about it. I really want to know it. But you won't be tested on really knowing it. You'll be tested on a little bit of knowledge about it. I don't know that there's enough time to explore because you'll use Grinnell's book for portfolio management. You'll use Fabozzi for fixed income. You'll use Hull for derivatives. Um... You might use, well, Green's probably level two for econometrics. I don't know who writes a good textbook for statistics. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch for that. But the danger of doing that is, is you know, you're going to collect nine textbooks uh, that are seven, 800 pages each. There's just simply no time to get that done. Uh, so it's it's nice to explore that way. It really is. Uh, there's no time. There's no time. Later, when you're done, there'll be time to say, you know what, I really like the uh, 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 the derivatives part of level one, two, and three. Then you can, uh, you know, dive deeper into those textbooks and learn more. Um, Japan finished level three in February, but I've been thinking of CFA if CFA is worth taking. Well, fund operations now trying to get in front office, but I'm not getting anywhere. Well, if you finish your level three, it's a little bit late to be thinking if it was worth taking or not. Uh, you're on the other side. You have it now. It is an accomplishment. Uh, you, 
you you might be saying that it's not helpful for where I want to go. Well, um, then it's not helpful. I would say that it hasn't been helpful in getting you what you want, but I don't know if I would say it wasn't worth it. I'm sure it was worth it. I'm sure there were parts of it, of the process, and some of the knowledge you have today that was worth it. It just not it may be helping you get to where you want to go, in which case maybe, maybe it's a different organization uh, that you need to be with. What do you know about the Buddhist philosophy? Uh, well, I, I, you know, it's it's kind of like, um, sort of like all religions. Um, I think the first tenant is, you know, uh, life is suffering, and and it, it's desire in life that is suffering. But dear God, I want desire in life, right? I, I uh, this idea, this this resignation that it's desire, uh, 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 your life's desires that will keep you unhappy. Uh, sorry, dude, about your life, that it was so, that it was so horrible. Uh, but I haven't found that, right? Don't you have desires? Don't you want feeling in your life? Don't you want desire in your life? I do, you know, and so you don't always get it, right? You're not always going, you're not always gonna get what you want, but, I'm going to quote Nietzsche here because I think it is a a a, a great uh, a great quote uh, from him. Is uh, the errors uh, of great men um, are far better uh, than the truths of small men? So go ahead and reach for the stars and fail. You'll still get further than than not not having desires. So I kind of reject it uh, on that basis. You know, I, I think I messed up the Nietzsche quote, but it is along those lines that, you know, the failures of great men, uh, along the lines the failures of great men far exceed, uh, you know, the truths of, of, of small men. Level two regression. Are there real world scenarios where estimated coefficients that are biased or wrong in other ways uh, actually get published? Seems ironclad enough for analysts not to not to let them slip. Yeah, yeah. If you, I think, if you took a hundred quantitative studies from academic journals at random, that probably forty of them uh, have have some kind of methodological error, have some kind of uh, uh, something in the in the process or something in the data in which you would say, whoa, 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 you can't do this. Um, yeah, I think that's quite common. <laughs> that's quite common, actually. You got to publish. You got to publish. You, you, you can't be held down by your data not cooperating, right? You have to publish. Uh, the live chat questions are not viewable after the live ends. Could you please turn on show chat to viewer? Can't filter community moderation. Um, where would I do that? I guess I got to do it when I set it up. Okay. Okay. Next time I uh, set one of these up, I will, uh, I will keep my eye open for that. Uh, uh, do you mind pronouncing your last name again? I always thought it was Mel Drum as I introduced your channel, my friends. It is Mark Mel Drum. Mel, the first part of Melon, Mel, and then a drum. Ba-dum-tsh, you know, Mel Drum. That's it. You got it. Mel Drum. How useful is the CFA in transitioning into an asset manager? This is something you ask your employer. Some employers think it's, think it's important. Others don't think it's important. Uh, so wherever you are employed, I would ask your, uh, the people who, who control your destiny in that respect. Mm-hmm. What is your opinion on long-term viability of equity research as a job? 
I see headcounts getting cut worldwide and I get nervous that I'm entering a dying industry. Uh, hmm. I don't think it's a dying industry. Uh, I think the role may evolve. I think uh, chat GP, or uh, the chat, uh, sorry, let's just ignore the first one. The LLM, the AI and large language models, I think will be productivity enhancing. They'll be incrementally useful, but I don't think that they're going to replace experience and intuition. Um, I think, you know, if you go back two years and look at the analysis I did of um, Tesla uh, when I, when I uh, uh, was, I think it was about two years ago. Uh, at the time, I don't think that any LLM looking at the data would have said what I said. Uh, I think that LLMs would have a very hard time in nonlinear thinking. Um, so, uh, same with Beyond Meat. I don't think that they would have they would have gotten to the same conclusion that I got to until well after Beyond Meat started going down in price. I don't think they'd come to the same conclusion with AT and T that I have, or with GM that I have, or with or with Copper or Freeport uh, uh, that I have. I, I think it would be difficult for them to come up with anything more than what past trends have have done. I don't know if they're capable of nonlinear thinking. I guess that's, it's supposed to be the promise of generative AI, but honestly, of all the generative AI prompts that you've done with ChatGPT, has it come up with anything beyond what it can find somewhere else and, and you know, summarize the findings of what it can find somewhere else? If it's trained on a set of data, can it possibly create something new that doesn't exist that is so radically different than the data? I don't think so. So if, if your type of analysis is linear analysis where you simply just take trends and you extrapolate trends, then yeah, you know, AI will probably replace you. Uh, but if you can see nonlinearities in the data, then no, I don't think so. It might make the uh, field smaller, uh, but those that remain will just be better. Mm, purpose of a covered pool of bonds for the bank and for SPE investors. Well, SPE investors don't have a covered pool. So um, a covered pool, the bonds stay on the balance sheet of the bank. Uh, but the bonds are kind of like, and I'm air quoting this, segregated. In other words, the bonds are there, whatever is, 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 a, is there, let's say it's just a bunch of loans, right? The, they're there. To, to as collateral against that particular bond issue. That's, that's why it's called a covered pool. It's, it's, and if one of those loans um, stop performing, it has to be replaced. Whereas with the SPE, um, the loans or the mortgages or whatever it is, leave the bank's balance sheet altogether. Uh, so that if one of them underperform, well, too bad. They underperform. So in the first case, the, um, you have, if you own a, uh, one of these bonds, you have recourse to the bank. In the second case, you do not have recourse to the bank. Possible to pass level two with just the Swayze secret sauce and doing all the online learning ecosystem questions properly two times. I don't know, I know nothing about you. You know, is it possible to pass level two without using anything? Yes. There are people who will self-study and not use anybody's resources and pass. So the, the absolute answer on that is yes. If you're saying, is it possible for you to do it? I don't know. I know nothing about you. Nothing about you. Turning 19 in June, be appearing for level one in August of 2024. I just, uh, I want to start working, but I have no idea where to apply as of now. What's the best way forward from here? Well, you're 19. 19, how, how, how are you appearing for level one in August of 2024 at 19? Are you in your third year of university already? Um, and what do you want to start working for at 19? Don't you want to be a teenager for two more years at least? <laughs> you know, like have fun, relax. 
doing a master's in finance, hoping to get some equity portfolio job. CFA seems advantageous, but rather learn something else more technical. But rather learn something else more technical. Well, CFA is a generalist designation, right? It's not a specialist designation. So maybe maybe something else first. Why is there a random chapter on economics in PM level two? Um, well, that's a good question. There is there is sort of a random chapter in there, right? Which which talks about the uh, intertemporal rate of substitution, uh, and and it's economics trying to uh, sort of muscle in on on somebody else's territory, which economics has always tried to do, has always tried to claim that it can explain absolutely everything, anywhere, anytime. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, let's see. And I think that's it for the CFA questions. Very good. And uh, we are pretty much near the end of our time. We've got about uh, eight minutes left here. Uh, anything else I can answer here? I want to understand how stock exchanges work on an in-depth level. If stock stocks trade on all U.S. exchanges, why does it matter on which exchange they list? Um... Uh, I guess I'm, if they... Well, you can uh, well, exchanges are are marketplaces, right? They're just they're just marketplaces. Uh, the where you list, there'll be listing requirements for where you list. Uh, so you have to live up to those listing requirements. But I mean, as far as trading on another exchange, exchanges are really, in the end, they're liquidity providers. It's a place. You know that that provide that just provides a liquidity. Is there any way to reduce fees for students who are going to register? Uh, well, I I'm not CFAI, so I I just I can't answer that one. Any advice on how what search for jobs in Canada? I'm sitting for level one in August, not working at the moment. I have two years' experience as a financial advisor in one of the big five banks. Uh, listen, when it comes to the job market, I, I say this every time, I am far removed from the job market. I have no idea what employers value. Uh, I have no idea what they look for uh, or uh, how, uh, um, you know, how competitive it is or how easy it is. I, I know nothing about that. I am far removed from the job market. Is it better to learn financial modeling instead of the CFA for investment banking and PE roles? Well, <laughs> those are not easy roles to get. Uh, you don't, you don't, you don't start in those roles. It's it's after a tour of duty somewhere else. Uh, but yes, yes, most definitely for that, especially investment banking. The CFA overkill for high net worth private wealth management. It's probably not relevant enough. I, I, I don't know that I would say it's overkill. It's simply just not relevant enough. Um, the CFP is probably uh, a better designation for you. Um, I think by far. Um, but uh, I, just don't, I just don't think it's relevant enough uh, or useful enough in that particular role. Better do an MBA after the CFA or add a CPA. MBA. Finding it difficult to understand portfolio management, where to look for material. Not asking for CFA for master's student. Well, well, I mean, any, any textbook on portfolio management, I would say. Um, I don't know that it's hard to find material on that. Any, any textbook on portfolio management. For the academic advising offered through your site, how has the feedback you received so far on it? Well, that's assuming I've received feedback on it. I, I don't know. 
how it's going. Um, you, you, I'm sure you all know, uh, two years ago, uh, April 1st, 2022, uh, I did sell the business to Serify. So there's a lot uh, internally that I'm not privy to, right? I mean, I, I still provide content, but I'm not an employee nor on the management team. So there are, you know, conversations I'm just not part of. So some of these things as from when it comes to the business, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to, to those things. All right. Okay, let's, uh, 627, let's wrap it up here because it is getting dark and uh, I've got to do the Q&A video uh, for the market outlook for tomorrow morning. Okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to hit end. I'm going to hit the X and exit.